In just seven days' time, this car will be racing in the European Formula 5000 Championship, if we can get it together. At the moment, it looks more like a bathtub than a car. It's got no engine, no suspension, no body, no wheels. Even the steering's wonky. In an old spinning mill in Bolton is the home of the Chevron Racing Car Company. Chevron builds 50 cars a year, each tailor-made for its driver. I'd signed on as a pit mechanic with David Purley, so it was his new car I was working on. David's been racing for eight years in Formula One and Two, including five Grand Prix. Now he wants to tackle the heaviest formula of all, Formula 5000. Because 5,000cc engines are so heavy, the body must be as light as possible. That's why the bathtub is made of aluminium, one-third the weight of steel, but just as strong. The wheel hubs are cast in magnesium and even lighter metal, and they're shaved down till they're as thin as milk churns. Everything is designed to save weight, even the nuts and bolts are hand-turned on the factory's lathe. If necessary, this means the cars can be put together in a rush. Chevron aren't usually waiting for outside suppliers. By early evening, the car was shaping up. I asked David if he thought we'd make it for the first race at Oldham Park. Well, I'm hoping so. Um, you can't really tell looking at a racing car like this without the bodywork on it. It always does look as if it's very incomplete, but um, my two lads here, they're going to be coming up here and working uh, all next weekend, so I'm, it will be ready. Ian Hilton, fellow mechanic Greg Field and Mike Earl, David's team manager, were all here to give the new car the once-over. The pedals are still a long way off, in fact. We've got to yeah. um, get the seat padded out and uh, get me sitting in it nice and tight. Well, what about the rev counter? Because that's all skew wood, isn't it? Mm, I thought that was a clock, actually, but uh, that's the rev counter, isn't it? <laughs> Is it supposed to be skew wood? <laughs> yeah, it said that it reads uh, 8,500 revs are up the top. Oh. So, you know, you've got something to line your eye up on. Mm. Mike decided Ian and Greg should stay two more days, see the car finish, then bring it down to the team's base in Sussex for testing. The rest of us would go ahead to get the mobile workshop ready for the new season. But first I found myself having a driving test. Every pit mechanic dreams of getting behind the steering wheel, and David said he'd take me out on the old Goodwood circuit, which is near his home. Only ever take your hand off the steering wheel when you're going to change gear. Yeah. All the rest of the time, just keep that hand firmly on the steering wheel. Yeah. If I handle the sports car well, he'd arrange for me to have a spin in a single seater while he was testing the new car. Uh, you want to take it a little bit easy. This is where Sterling Moss went off, oh, you yeah. remember? Yeah. And uh, I always try and impress on people it is a bit of a dangerous corner. Yeah. Now we've got the left hand, so it's brakes yes. changed down. And it's wet, so. Watch it a little bit. Yeah. That's it. Use up all the road. Out to the right hand side, flip that grass. That's it. Good. And now right hand corner. Brake. A bit fast and you've knocked it into neutral. Yeah. It's alright, hold Come it. On. You're okay. That's it. Yeah. Well done. When you do a gear change, always make sure it's positive, otherwise you do tend to knock it into neutral and then you you know yeah. you can throw out. Fine, well held. And now it's very wet through the uh, chicane. Second gear. Good. Fine. Well done. Well, well, it's easy, isn't it? Yeah, it's not bad, actually. Uh, how did I do on my first circuit? Very well, very Thank well. You. you didn't scare me, let's put it that way. Beautiful <laughs> answer. <laughs> that afternoon, I helped Mike Earl pack up the team lorry. This acts as a garage and workshop when we're away from base. The first race at Oldham Park in Cheshire was 300 miles away, so it was imperative that nothing got left behind. I the exhaust. Uh, da, da, da. Seems we've got everything apart from the kitchen sink. Well, when you go away, you try and duplicate the workshop entirely from the back of your truck. Yeah. So that whatever happens, you're in a position to fix it. Apart from the workshop, you seem to be duplicating the car as well. Yes, well, anything can happen in motor racing. If it doesn't, you're not really putting it together and trying. So really, you've, uh, you've almost got to take uh, a second car in bits. 
Yes, exactly. Yeah, you wrong. reckon have one car complete yeah. and another car in bits. How much of the stuff you're taking, Spurs, do you get through? Not very much, I hope, but no. if you have a bad smash, you look a bit silly if you've run out of spares and you can't run for a tuppenny hackney bit. Oh. Next morning, the completed bathtub arrived from Bolton. As promised, David produced a Formula Atlantic car for me to drive, and we both wore special helmets with a built-in headset so he could talk to me over a radio link. OK, John, can you hear me? Yeah. Fine. All right, well, if you just follow in the, uh, the tracks directly behind me and try and take the same sort of line that I do around the corners, OK? It holds the road nice and uh, tight, does it? Yeah, that's what everybody does think when the first time they ever drive a single-seater, that it uh, really sticks to the road. Yeah. Nice bit of power, you can feel it as well. Well, what's yours like, uh, being a new car out? What's it feel like? Well, at these sort of uh, speeds, we're not really pushing it. You know, it, uh, it's a bit difficult to tell, but it, at the moment it feels OK. The wheels are going around, that's the main thing. Well, this, this is this nasty bend coming up. You've got to be a bit careful here, yeah. Uh, drop it down into about third, OK, and just follow directly behind me. Yeah. Now the, now the tight left-hander, third gear, but use all the road, allowing the car to drift right out. Uh, yeah. Oh, I'm catching up with you. Yeah, okay. that's fine. Right. Hang on, I missed a gear again. <laughs> no, I got it. I'm back. I always miss a gear on this one. Yeah, they're going to rename that Noakes' corner, I think. Now we're on the fastest part. This is Lavent. What's your rev reading now, John? Uh, six and a half. Well, that's well over 100 miles, about 120 miles an hour, so we're not doing badly. This yellow marker coming up now, hit your brakes there, and then yeah. down into third, fourth down into third. Right. And we've got that uh, chicane, haven't we, coming up now? Yeah, and it's, uh, there's rather a lot of water behind it, so be a bit careful there, because we're on slick tyres. Yeah. Second gear. Half a dozen laps were enough to put the new car through its paces, but David suggested I try a few laps solo, and I jumped to the chance. But I soon saw how easy he'd been making it. Now I had to find the correct line on each bend, judge the fastest safe speed and select the right gear. A racing driver who means to win must do this faultlessly, bend after bend, lap after lap. Just one mistake could cost him the victory or his life. Every racing team ends up working against the clock and the car had to be in Cheshire early the next day for official practice. OK, Mike. Have a nice trip, Charlton. See you up there. Bye. It's important for David to get a good night's sleep. So he made the journey northward by private plane and I travelled with him. He told me about the Oldham circuit on the way, a bit trickier than Goodwood. It had been redesigned during the winter and some of the bends were very tight. They've uh, cut the track off at uh, going into Cascades and I think they've shortened it by about a mile and a half. Is this going to make it more difficult for you, or...? Well, it's going to make the track a lot slower, and um, it's probably going to make it a bit more difficult for Formula 5000 cars, because there's a very tight hairpin bend now, which Formula 5000s don't really like. I asked David about the dangers of motor racing. A few years ago, a friend of his, Roger Williamson, was killed, and David won the George Medal trying to save him. That was during the uh, Dutch Grand Prix at Zandvoort in 1973. And uh, it was just an unfortunate accident. His tire, front tire burst and he uh, left the track and hit the Armco barrier, which bent over and, and uh, turned his car over upside down and the thing caught fire. I think it happened on lap 13. I, I had uh, hung back to about 30 yards behind Roger because I was aiming to slipstream past him on that straight. And um, I suddenly saw him swerve off the road and, and uh, hit the barrier and overturn. I, I was hard on the brakes trying to avoid wreckage and wheels and things that were spread across the track. I stopped on the opposite side of the road and just started running towards the crash, which had started burning. By the time I got there, there was only, there was only a small fire there, in fact, around the, the back end of the gearbox, mm. where the fuel tanks had ruptured. The trouble was that there was a, uh, a fire engine and an ambulance only about 200 yards up track from where it happened, but they couldn't get uh, to where we were because of the Armco barrier. They were on the inside of the circuit. It wouldn't have happened in England, I can assure you. Bolton Park next morning presented something that could only happen in England, a bank holiday snowstorm. No one was sure if the meeting would go ahead, so there seemed little point in unloading the cars.
but the track had been kept clear by gritting. At midday, it was declared fit for practice. This threw up a knotty problem for the teams in the paddock. Which kind of tyres to use? The deep treaded ones designed for wet weather or the ball slicks meant for dry roads? The conditions out there today are going to be such that where the snow's melting and going across the track, it's going to be too damp for the dries, yeah. but too dry for wets. They wear out very quickly. So we're trying to make an intermediate tyre which will cope with both conditions. It was a calculated risk. Other teams were making do with wets, only practice would show if Mike was right. And how do you feel before practice, Dave? I'm a bit nervous. I'm not really as nervous as I should feel. But... Well, why is this? Uh, any particular reason? What? Any, any particular reason? Uh, I think it's probably because I used to be a paratrooper and I used to get pretty nervous waiting to jump, and uh, this seems a bit of an anti climax. <laughs> I know what you mean. She parachuted, you know what it's like. <laughs> to play safe, we took our wet tyres over to the pits in case David found he wasn't getting enough grip on the intermediates. last one hour and is deadly serious. The cars that notch up the fastest lap times get the front positions on the starting grid next day. So there are full safety precautions. A control point every hundred yards with flag marshals and firefighting equipment. The flags are warnings for the drivers. Blue means that a car is being closely followed. Yellow means caution, there may be water on the track ahead or an accident. Meanwhile, I signalled David his previous lap time so he could see if he was getting faster. What's the time, uh, Mike? 10.2. 10.2. He's going minus, quicker. Minus 2.2, Greg. Above us in the race control office, the official timekeepers also kept check, each one timing four cars. Usually the fastest laps come in the middle of practice when the drivers have sized up the circuit and the weather conditions. But before the cars start to develop faults and make for the pits. One minor problem, a loose water hose, and one more serious. David wasn't sure about the tyres. He wanted to try a few laps on wets, just to see if this would increase his speed. A really fast wheel change can win a race. We managed it in just under a minute, which left David eight minutes to try for a fast lap time. And the gamble paid off. Back in the paddock after practice, as everyone started to get the cars ready for the race, the official times came over the PA. On his last but one lap, David had knocked three seconds of his previous best. Only two others had faster times, so he'd be certain of a front-line position on the starting grid the next day. How was that, Dave? Well, not bad, but I'm a bit worried about these tyres lasting out the race because uh, we're on dry, we're on wet tyres, whereas you know, it's pretty dry out there, and I think they're going to start chunking. Are you going to have to go back to the intermediate? <laughs> I don't know. You know, I think it's going to start snowing again. Very soon. What does it do to the uh, the gallon? Between about six and seven gallons. Master gallon. With these things, in actual fact, we're better off putting those uh, wets on these than using the melmax for the dries. 
Well, I just wrote off to all the big teams yeah. and asked them if they had a job. And somebody eventually said yes? Yes, eventually I went out and saw some people and that's how I got in here. You never wanted to go on further, have you, and become a driver like David? Uh, not really. I, well, I've, I've tried. I've had a go at clubman's racing. Yeah. But, uh, as far as I went. But you, you'd rather stick to the uh, to the engineering side? Well, yeah, it's very interesting. You stay alive more at this end, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> it's cold. It's not the dampness yeah. of the track, it's yeah. the cold. There's yeah. water running off it, though, from the sides. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. In the end, David plumped for the intermediate tyres. There was more snow forecast overnight, but he reckoned that the track would have dried off again by lunchtime. The wets would then get too hot and start to chunk. Bits of the tread would simply disintegrate and fall off. Why this left-hand tread on the left on one side and right on the other? It's just safety, really. What are your feelings as this piece of machinery goes hurtling round that you've worked on? Basically, I just hope David can keep it on the road. Yeah. And if anything goes wrong, do you, do you worry? And... Oh, it's always a tense moment getting near the end of the race when you're possibly leading. Yeah. It's always much worse at the end because you can still not finish, you know, the lap to go. Ian, Greg and I worked on late into the evening, whilst outside we heard the snow ploughs droning round the track, keeping the circuit clear. And next morning dawned sunny, as David had hoped. By early afternoon, much of the snow had melted and the track was almost dry with just a few pools of water remaining. Too late for us to be of much help now, we'll stand by. But if David has more than a momentary stop during the 57 minute race, he'll lose any chance of a good position. To win in Formula 5000, you've got to keep out of the pits. There's still uncertainty about tyres. Alongside David is Dave Walker. At the last moment, he decides to hedge his bets. Dries on the front, wets on the back. 30 seconds to go. David tells me the intermediates will give him the edge on Walker at the start. If he can beat him off the grid, he'll be able to cut in front of him before the first bend. Walker's wheel change is only just finished in time. And he does make a slow start. David takes his chance and pulls up to Lodge Corner in the lead. Ian tells me this isn't only the best, it's the safest place to be on the first lap. Whilst the other 24 jockey for position behind, there's nothing in front but an empty track. On that new right-hander, his speed drops to 30, but David still maintains his lead. Out front is indeed Dave Purley with the Southern Organs leg Chevron Ford. Here he is, number 35. Dave Purley twitching a bit as he comes to the lead. And second is Tom Belcher. The beginning of lap two and a reminder that bad luck can strike at any time, even after one minute's racing. It is a multiple incident which started, in fact, it started with um, Bennett and Ashley. The driver's getting out, there's a lot of smoke, it looked nasty. I think it's Ashley and I think he's safely out of the race. Whilst Ian Ashley and his team figure out why their main drive shaft snapped, we keep our fingers crossed that nothing like that ends Davis' chances. Five laps later, with 45 more to go, he's still in first position, but close behind is Gordon Spice in number 41. Spice challenges going down the cascades and pulls clear of David as they round Foster's. From now on, the lap board is all important. It's difficult for David to keep track of his position, impossible to remember how many laps are left. The afternoon hots up, and oddly enough, this means the track gets wetter as more melting snow drains onto it. On intermediate tyres, David is tending to lose addition on these wet patches.
First into the pits is Tom Belso. He started the race on slicks. Now he decides he'll be safer on wets. Mike tells me he can see Davies not happy with his tyres either. And on lap 15, he drops to third. But the last thing he can afford now is a pit stop. Ten minutes later, David's lap times start to speed up. On lap 35, he sneaks back into second position going into Lodge, although Greg and I don't realise it until he comes past the pits again. Dave Walker, who's been lying fifth, runs into tyre trouble on lap 42. The mixture of wets and dries hasn't worked. Four laps to go. David is only 16 seconds behind Gordon Spice, but Guy Edwards in his white Lola only yards behind him. Can David hold him off to the finish? At the flag, Spice takes the victory, running level with Dave Walker, now a whole lap behind the leaders. We count the seconds. David should appear in the next quarter of a minute. Another car, but like Walker, it's still on lap 49. So is one of the next pair, but on the right is Guy Edwards. Somehow he's passed David and taken second place. Six seconds later, David comes in a disappointed third. The most dangerous race I've ever had since 1968. I nearly lost it, I don't know how many times. Is it all the salt on? No, it's not the salt, it's just the tyres, yeah. like concrete. Yeah. They're yeah. the hardest dry tyres I've ever seen. You, uh, you came through. About four, four laps from the end and you were second. Yeah. And then uh, you just lost it somewhere. Well, I spun twice. A I, I, uh, guy up would just chop me off going down towards Nicker Brook, uh, towards Cascade. Yeah. And uh, I overcorrected and lost it. And I spun three times at over 100 miles an hour. But fortunately, it was in gear. The funny thing was, it stopped, the, it stopped spinning, still doing about 30 miles an hour, going straight down the track. So I just let the clutch out and away again. I'll tell you what, I know that just around that top bend before the start, you came round. You all, Got well, the, car, the, the back end of the car gets light coming over that little hump, yeah. you know, just before the pits, and the back end was just flicking every yeah. time. It's yeah. the most dangerous race I've ever had. We're going to have to get down, to sit down together and say, right, we're not going to use those tyres anymore because they're lethal. Yeah. yeah. They say the only race worth worrying about is the next one. For David, Mike, Greg and Ian, that means three days later at Brands Hatch. Another drive through the night, another hectic, noisy practice, but not another third place. As any pit mechanic worth his salt will tell you, the next race is the one you will win.